try to make worship something big, something impressive, something that, quite honestly, I think is almost repulsive sometimes to God, but it's kind of what we do. We, we like to go big, don't we? I was thinking about the words of Micah, where you know, the worshiper is saying, you know, I'm going to bring all of this stuff, I'm going to bring all of this sacrifice, I'm going to bring all of this oil, I'm going to going to make it big, and God reminds him of what's required, and it's to love mercy, what is it, walk justly, love mercy, and no, help me out here, yeah, I can figure this out, it's to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, there we go, I got it, I got it, and was reminded again of Romans 12.1, where we are living these days, in Romans chapter 12, um, but it's uh, in view of God's mercy. We're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. He doesn't want the show. He doesn't want the flesh. He, doesn't, he simply wants us. He simply wants us. This morning, we're looking at one more kind of attribute of a life that's fully surrendered and sacrificed to Christ. And we are looking at verses 9 through 12. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn there. But I want to indulge you for just a moment in what I think is one of the greatest moments in the history of this church. Right? There might be several people, or at least a couple people in this room, or close by that would agree with me. And uh, it happened in 1996, 22 years ago. And it was uh, surrounding our church softball team. Yes, our church softball team. That was one of the best softball teams. It may have been the best softball team that I've ever had the privilege of playing softball with. I mean, we hit well, we fielded well, we ran well, we pitched well. Um, none of uh, none of which the guys who were on that team back then can do today. But uh, if I remember right, if I remember right, we won our league here in Columbus uh, by beating a very, very big and very strong and very talented team from All Saints Lutheran Church over on High Street. Um, man, they were intimidating. It felt like David versus Goliath. It really did. I mean, they were, they were massive guys. And we beat them in the championship game. And then we all loaded up in our cars and we headed towards Cincinnati to the Nazarene National <coughs> Softball Tournament. And if you're not familiar, uh, Springdale Church of the Nazarene, they host a softball tournament every year. And it draws Nazarene softball teams from all parts of the country. I think there are generally somewhere 70 teams, plus or minus a few, um, and, and it's some of the best church softball that you would ever want to be a part of. And in 1996, because we did have such a solid team, we felt like we were going to be able to play a while in the main tournament. I mean, we wanted to play with the best of the best that year, and we, we felt like we could. Uh, because we really were a quality team. But if I remember correctly, and I don't, so I'm making half of this up, uh, it's been 22 years after all. But right away at the beginning of the tournament, we played one of the best teams that was there, and we lost, but it was a pretty respectable loss. I mean, it was, I think both teams scored around 10 runs, they just happened to edge us out. So we were all still very hopeful that the best part of the tournament was ahead of us. And then I think we may have won a game. Again, I don't remember, but, you know, that, that doesn't matter. The point of the story is this. We showed up for our third game, and we started pounding the softball. I mean, we, we, we were scoring run after run after run. We double, single, uh, you know, we would get hustle runs. There were a couple home runs mixed in. We were playing incredible softball. And before long, we found ourselves up by a score of something like 22 to 4. I mean, we were demolishing this team. And it looked like uh, we were just, we, we had hit our stride as a team. And then we get to the bottom of the fourth inning, and we are we're, we're destroying this team. And the unthinkable happened. They just started getting little blue hits. And then maybe a more solid single, and maybe a double, and <coughs> nothing that was I mean, nothing that was too bad. And, and you know, we're not too worried about it, because after all, we're up 22 to 4. 
But before long, we started to sweat a little bit. And they just kept hitting the wall and hitting the wall. And a little pop-up was dropped right over our infielders' heads and in front of our outfielders. And they scored run after run after run after run. And finally, in I think it was the bottom of the fourth inning, again, you can't hold me quite to that, but it was before the game should have been over, the officials stood up and said, I'm sorry, guys, I have to cancel this game. You've gone over your time limit, and we lost 26 to 24, 22, 26 to 22. And we didn't get a single out on that team in that inning. They just kept hitting the ball, hitting the ball, hitting the ball. And so our dreams of playing deep into that tournament were over. But we got to go back on Monday to play in what's called the Consolation Tournament. <laughs> the Consolation Tournament. And we played on Monday. And this was awesome, right? We walked out of there with the second place trophy. The second place trophy. And, and that, my friends, is one of the most historic days in the life of Northwest Church. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that deserves applause. Um, that deserves applause. All right. So, thank you for indulging me on that. Let's get to our sermon. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. Um, as we read these verses together, it's clear that Paul is describing to the Roman Christians what it looks like to be the church. What it looks like to be the church. And we uh, um, have said, uh, starting a week ago, by reading the very first verses, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what's good. Uh, that when we, the church, show up, when we show up, our love for each other has to be real. The mask has to come off, come off and we have to make ourselves completely available if we are genuinely going to love one another, right? Uh, scripture's clear that we as Christians are to love one another, that we in the church, in the local body of Christ, that we are to live in community. And, and, and he goes on to say then at the end of verse 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That speaks to our motives. Uh, in this verse, he's saying that we are to have a pure motive when we do get together and we express our love to one another, that our motive is to be pure. And, and it's, you know, as human beings, we're constantly working to filter out all that crud. But if we hate what's evil, we're wrong in the sight of God, and we do our best to cling to what's good, it, it, he's busy purifying our hearts as we do that. And so, uh, we're to love, our love has to be sincere, we're to hate what's evil and cling to what's good. And in these next verses, Paul gives the Roman church a list of imperatives uh, that require action on our parts, that have to happen in our relationships with one another in the church. And if our relationships are built on pure love and out of the right heart, then these imperatives should be present when we come together as the local church body. So look at, let's look at these, starting in verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Just very short, very short points that Paul's making that have an awful lot of depth to them if we are going to look like the church that Paul envisioned and God intended. It's an eight-point sermon, I think is what it is today. It was going to be longer, but I shortened it by one. Aren't you glad of that? So let's look at the first one. Uh, the first one is this, we are to be devoting to one another in love. Devoting to one another in love. Uh, the word that love, for love that Paul uses there is the word phileo, which is the same as Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. Um, we, we are to love one another like a brother loves a brother. Um, we're family. We're family. It's that simple. And that doesn't mean that we're always going to get along. It means that we are going to have our differences, but even in our differences, we stick together. We stick together. 
Uh, I learned what that looks like when I was pastoring uh, down at Lower Lights in Franklinton. And I would have families come to me uh, from time to time and they, you know, uh, I remember one time there was this mother, she's like, I'm done with my son, he's out of here, I don't have anything to do with him, he's no good, he's rotten. I'm like, wow, that's pretty vicious, right? That's pretty vicious. Uh, but there was, a, there was a conflict there, there was a difference there, and she was done. But I'll tell you what, the minute that somebody else stood against her son, or she saw her son not surviving, she brought him right back in. In our differences, we can still love one another and be devoted to one another. And that's what Paul is saying here. And I would take it a step further than that and say that as family, we're devoted to see each other reach God's best for us. Right? I'm devoted to see you reach your best for God. I want to see you grow up and mature and become all that God has intended for you to be. And that's what it looks like to be devoted to one another. The second imperative is this, honoring one another above yourselves. In verse 3 of this chapter, uh, Paul had already kind of warned us against pride when he said, don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought but think of yourselves instead with sober judgment. He's saying that a lot of times we as humans, and, and it happens, it happens outside in the world, it happens in the church, we become prideful. We become prideful. We, we start to think that, you know what, maybe I'm the best Christian in the church. Right? Um, my, my sins don't stink as bad as theirs do. And, and Paul is saying Honor, or, or he's saying, um, he, he's saying here, honor one another above yourself. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And he's reminding of that, of us, of that in this verse. Honor one another above yourselves. And I think that happens in a couple of ways. The first one is just mutual respect. I've said this before, um, but oftentimes our differences create distance between us. And when we don't respect each other, we push each other away. Our differences create distance. And, and in, this, in this directive, what Paul is saying is that every person, every person, regardless of how they look in the world's eyes, they're essential in the eyes of God. And if they are here, they're essential to this local church or this local community. Young, old, middle-aged, married, rich, poor, single, um, healthy, sick, white, black, Republican, or Democrat. It doesn't matter. Together, we are the church, and each person is to be honored by the other above themselves. Mutual respect. It flows both ways. It has to. It has to flow both ways. Which means sometimes we might have to put our interests aside and prop up the interests of the other so that they can grow. That's what it means. We respect each other mutually. And with that, there's a mutual servanthood. You know, we're called to serve one another. We're called to, we're called to serve each other. And in an unspoken way here, what Paul is doing is he is warning us against pride and he's challenging us to do exactly what Jesus did, who was the creator of all heaven and earth, and he put that aside, put on humanity, and knelt and washed his disciples' feet. There's no room for pride in the body of Christ. And when our love for each other and our mutual respect for each other, and when we're honoring one another above ourselves, um, it, it, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. When we become more concerned about the other person than we are about ourselves. And that takes us to the next directive of Paul's, which is never lacking in zeal. Never lacking in zeal. You know, as I was reading this, uh, what I noticed this time through is, is that this is the only directive that Paul gives us that has a negative word in it. It's all positive, 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 but when we read this one, it's never lacking in zeal. And I think that Paul made it a negative because he wanted the Roman church to feel the sting of this one. And I think he wants us to feel the sting of it as well. 
In our culture, a lot of times we uh, mistake zeal for enthusiasm. When we see somebody running ahead, Ooh, let's go get it. You know, they're ready to charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. Let's let's be zealous. Let's go. Um, that's not really zeal. That's not really zeal. Zeal is not to be confused with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm comes and goes. If our zeal were determined by enthusiasm or emotion, there's no way that, that we could never be lacking. Because our emotions go like this. Our enthusiasm goes like this. But instead, zeal is a dedication that's rooted in a fundamental decision. It's rooted in a decision that we made to follow Jesus. The old kid song, I have decided to follow Jesus. That's zeal. And it doesn't matter whether you're six years old and singing that or 60 and singing it. That decision that you made to follow Jesus is zealous. It's zeal to live a godly life. And it's zeal to see his purposes achieved in the church and in the world. And that zeal goes through thick and thin. It exists through thick and thin. It exists through good times and tough times. So what does he want us to be zealous about? <laughs> it gets kind of dangerous in the church because of what happens a lot of times is we get distracted by a hundred good things and forget about the main thing. What's the church called to do? The Great Commission very simply says that we are to go into all the world and make disciples. Pretty simple. But that's the work of the church. That's what we are to be about, is going into all the world, including our neighbor, right? Go into all the world and make disciples. That's our work. That's what we're called to do. And if we lose sight of that, if we get lazy at that, if we get distracted with all of the good stuff that's out there for us to do and fail to fulfill the Great Commission, we're falling short of God's call to us. We're failing to be what the church has called us to be, or is called to be. The fourth one looks sort of similar to this, but it's not. Keeping your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Keeping your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I love this directive. Um, to me, the imagery in this directive is, is so rich that it's become one of the verses that informs my ministry and, and me as a Christian. It's, see the root for the word fervor that's in there? Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord it is the same word as the word for fire. And so what Paul is saying here is that we are to keep our spiritual fire serving the Lord. That's what it's saying. All right, I need some help. I, I was trying to figure out how to illustrate this. This may not be good, but I'm going to give it a shot. Come here, come here, come here. Jacob, come here. Stephen, come here. Who else can I pick on? Paige, come here. Louis, come here. Come on up here. Come on up on the big stage. You guys are going to help me lead a song. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right, anybody like to barbecue? To cook out on charcoal grill? All right, so, so here's the thing, right? Picture each one of these individuals as a piece of charcoal, charcoal for cat, okay? Got that? All right. Um, would you ever put your charcoal for cats in a, in a uh, grill if they were lined up like this? Why not? It won't work. It, it what? Not enough fire. Okay, so come here. Let's stack you in here. Let's stack you in here. Come on, right here. Come on in, in. Come on up front here, up here. We're gonna put you right in front. We're gonna put you in the back, and 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 we're just just okay. Would it work now? Better. Better, right? I mean, if we really were doing this right, we'd start stacking them on top of each other, right? And we'd have this pile of charcoal baguettes. And then we put a little lighter fluid on there and then touch it with the match. And before long, right, you get this big burst that's all the lighter fluid. And then the coals start to burn themselves. And, and because they're in contact with one another, they, they fuel each other. 
They view each other. Get in there. <laughs> <laughs> You roll. <laughs> We're going to deal with the one to roll away. <laughs> if we want to put this fire out, what do we do? Start separating them, right? This is an incredible picture of the local church. An incredible picture of it. Because when everyone is in here tight, and in contact, and living in community, and they're fueling the fire for each other. That's beautiful. Thanks, man. <laughs> right? This guy's fire is blowing a little brighter and a little hotter because of this guy's fire and this girl's fire. Right? And we fuel each other. We fuel each other. The, the problem is, in the American church today, is that everything in our culture is about this. <laughs> everything in our culture is about taking the core that's supposed to be worshiping together and serving together and growing together and challenging each other and pulling it apart. And the fire in the church in America is a whole lot dimmer today than it ought to be. That's not just our church, folks. That's the church in America. There's nobody being added to the church in America. And so what's happening overall, all right, when you separate this and this fire goes a little bit more dim, what are you going to do, Lewis? Two things. Number one, he's going to burn out. Number two, he's going to go over here to this church because he hears the fire's a little hotter over there. Only to find out it's not. I think we're in a crisis in America in the church because we don't know what it looks like to live in community with one another and let his fire fuel my fire. And we're never satisfied, so we keep going to what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next. And all that really needs to happen is these poles need to be stacked in a little tighter. And the fire of the Holy Spirit needs to regenerate what's taking place there. Did my charcoal forgets to do a good job. When somebody chooses to walk away, their flame should feel a little bit cooler. A lot of times when they choose to walk away today from the church, they actually feel like their flame's a little hotter. And we as the local body of Christ, we should miss every single coal that leaves regardless of who they are. And when people walk into this church, they should say, wow, there is something amazing here. <laughs> Look at how each coal is doing its part. Look at how they're burning together. Look at how they love God and how they love each other. There is no denying that the kingdom of God, his holy healing and cleansing presence is moving in their midst. By the way, that's what fire is all about, isn't it? Fire purifies. Fire cleanses. Fire burns, but it's for our ultimate good. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. It takes us to the fifth directive, rejoicing in hope. If we don't have hope, it's impossible to move forward in the life, in life, in a healthy, successful, godly way. Everything in this world pulls us away from hope. All you got to do is just watch the news for 10 minutes and you'll know that. For that matter, all you really have to do is walk out your front door and you'll see how hopeless our world is. But as Christians, as the church, we're to rejoice in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. No matter what the circumstances are that we find ourselves in. 1 Peter uh, 1.13 reminds us of this. It says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope in Jesus Christ. Set your hope in him. No matter what circumstance, uh, uh, let, let's see, set your hope on the grace 
to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. That's where our hope comes from. It, it comes from the grace of God that's been offered to us in the life, in the death, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But ultimately our hope rests in the fact that he is returning for us. He's coming back. I don't know about you, but I struggle to keep that hope by myself. I struggle to keep it by myself. If it's just me and the news, man, I get frustrated. I get depressed watching what's happening. When I walk out on my front porch and listen to my neighbors screaming at each other and their kids, I lose hope. That's why I need you to encourage me. I need you. I need the church to help me to rejoice in the hope that is real. I need you to help me with number six as well, enduring in affliction. Enduring in affliction. The Roman church knew what affliction was. They, they were enduring persecution. They were watching their own literally being eaten alive by lions. We don't have to endure that type of affliction. But if you haven't noticed today, I want to remind you that the spiritual realm is very real. And the enemy of our soul will do all he can to afflict pain on us. Because he wants to win. And he wants us to lose. His attacks are ruthless. They're painful. And they're life-sucking. And we need each other to help us endure the affliction of our enemy. And how do we do that? Through number seven, the seventh directive, continuing in prayer. Continuing in prayer. Can you pray by yourself? Absolutely. Should you pray by yourself? Absolutely. But Paul here is talking to the church as a whole. And his directive is to pray together. To pray together. Prayer is essential. Because when you pray... My prayers are being added to your prayers. When you have a need, we as the body can take that need to the Father for you. You know, there, there are times, there are times, there have been times in my life when it's been impossible for me to pray. I can't utter the words. But to know that the church is praying for me when I can't pray for myself is what keeps me going. It's what keeps me continuing. You see, when I pray, I'm encouraged because I can't pray like you. Isn't that fascinating? I can't pray like you. Now, a lot of times we say that as an excuse. Well, well I, I can't tell you the number of times. Well, I think Steve actually <laughs> said this to me. Sorry, man, your sermon illustration again today. I think you said to me, well, you're like a silver tongue something when you pray. I can't pray like that. Guess what? I can't pray like you. I can't pray like you. There are some people who use lots of imagery in their prayers, and I need that. There are some people who use lots of scripture in their prayers, and I need that. There are some people whose prayers are young and naive, and I need that. And there are some people who, whose prayers are, are wise because they've been around, and I need that. There are some people whose prayers are very proper and formal and respectful of who God is, and I need that. And there are some prayers that are very informal, and they refer to God the Father as something like Daddy. And I need to hear that and be reminded. When all of our prayers, with all of our personalities mixed together and ascend to heaven, there's a beautiful concert that's taking place. And we need the prayers of each other if we're going to be the church that God's created us to be. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, you've heard it before, pray continually. I like the version that says, pray without ceasing. Because it says, we pray without ceasing. That's the engine, folks. That's it. As we pray without ceasing, that's the engine that makes this Christian life possible. It's what keeps us going. Eighth directive that Paul comes up with in here is sharing with believers who are in need. 
You know, the early church was marked by sharing with one another. If you look at Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32, it says this. It says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons <coughs> among them. What? There were, I have to, am I reading this right? There were no needy persons among, that's what it says. No one had a need. See, from time to time, those who owned land or houses, they sold them and they brought the money from the sales and they put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And in this verse, Paul is directing the Roman church that this should be the practice within their community of believers as well. And by relation, I think he's directing us that that should be the practice within our community of believers also. The, the Christian community, the local church, should be marked by this type of radical selfless giving. Oh, and, and not just giving financially to meet a need. But I really think what he's saying here is invest yourself, all of you, to meet the needs of those around us that are worshiping together with us. It's kind of easy to meet a financial need. It's a lot more difficult to meet an emotional need or a security need. But if love is real, then that type of giving marks the community. <coughs> and then we all gets finally to the last directive in here. I think that this is a, a kind of a bridge directive. I don't think it really fits with today, and I don't know that it really fits with next week. And I'll explain a little bit more about that next week, but, but what I see here, what I picture is Paul uh, kind of going through this list. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope, endure affliction, continue in prayer. Share with all the believers in need. And then I think he says, hmm, I think what I'm really trying to say to you guys is this. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Do you know our normal posture is to keep people out? That's our normal posture. I don't know where we learn it. I don't know where we come up with it. But our normal posture is to keep people out. I, I could prove it, but I already had a group of people up here that I would show, that I would bring back up to show you this. But if I put one person over here and eight people over here, right? And, and I said to them, all right, his objective or her objective is to get into your group. That's all I would say. This group over here, as soon as I said, ready, set, go, this group over here would lock arms and they would keep that person out. That's our normal posture. <laughs> Is it time to go? Or what are you trying to go? Oh my goodness. It won't be long, I promise. Oh, man. Woo! You know, we've become really good. Now, we're almost there, I promise. I'm almost done with my nine-point sermon. I told you eight earlier, it's nine. Um, we, we're really good at entertaining. But there's a difference between entertaining and hospitality. In entertaining is Martha Stewart. Okay? Gifted, gifted lady who gives and gives and gives, but, but she gives this nice formal appearance. Hospitality is the pioneer woman. Right? Hey, y'all, come on in. It's time for dinner. In, entertaining is kind of like the handshake. We put our best foot forward, but we only give a little bit. We give one hand. Hospitality is um, when we 
bought our house, uh, one of the unique features of a 100-year-old house down in Franklinton, one of the unique features of it is, is you're coming down the steps. You can either go to the left and down, or you can go to the right and down. And, and I remember the first time somebody explained that to me. Now, it may not completely measure up, but, but here's, here's the imagery. You can go left, or you can go right. And those two staircases are the open arms of hospitality. The open arms of hospitality. It, it, hospitality is not a handshake. It's an embrace. What you're doing is you are saying to the other person, better or for worse, you've got me. Because you're a Christ follower, I'm part of the body of Christ, and I'm part of the body of Christ. We're brothers. We're sisters. And if we are going to be the community of believers that God desires us to be, we got to do this together. We've got to peel the veil off. We've got to let our love be real. And we've got to put our love into action. I'm going to take you back to this historic day in September 1996. That's not the trophy. That's a story. This one is. <laughs> you, you see, when we got to the end of the tournament, we ended up second place in the Constellation Tournament, which, by the way, is a pretty big deal. That's like 50 teams by the time you play the Monday. The uh, tournament, the guys who ran the tournament came and proved, what happened to the plate? <laughs> okay, so it's been laying on its side in the trophy case ever since 1996. And I'm probably the only person that's looked at it again until you guys today. So, so here's, so here it is. It's, the title of the trophy is The Longest Distance Travel. We didn't travel before this physically. What that meant was after we were heartbroken and defeated, we traveled back together. And it was a sportsmanship award. Out of all the 70 teams that were participating in that tournament, your church softball team got the sportsmanship award. You see, they, they recognized that we could have given up out of frustration. We could have turned on each other. They realized that we could have turned on the officials. Honestly, they realized that we didn't even have to come back on Monday because a lot of teams get beat, they throw up their hands and they leave. They're done. They realized that we could have let adversity stop us from being successful on Monday. But instead, as a team, we pulled together. We played together, we encouraged one another, we covered for one another. When we were tired, we pressed on for each other. And the result was a second place tournament trophy. And, and, and a reminder that we embodied what that tournament was all about to start with. Solid sportsmanship and Christ likeness <coughs> we played. In a way, what happened on the softball field that day, and quite honestly, all through that season and beyond, because as a, a bunch of guys, we were really committed to one another. We spurred one another on to Christ's likeness. We pushed each other to be the best men, the best husbands, the best fathers that we could be. And in some strange way, we were a picture of Romans 12, 9 through 12. And here's the thing. Paul is saying that this is the standard for the local church. The standard. It's the bare minimum. It's not supposed to be the exception. It's supposed to be the norm wherever Christ is worshipped. That includes right here. I honestly don't know what you want to do with this morning. 
I hated preparing today because it challenged me so deeply. Because there are times, many times, I don't measure up. There are many times that those directives go one ear and out the other because I'm too busy doing my thing. I think we have a closing song. Bring your worship team up. Let's. Um, I'm just going to ask you as we sing this song. Is it an upbeat song? I don't remember. Our God saves. That's appropriate for an altar call. I think any song is appropriate for an altar call. I don't know how you want to respond. Maybe it's for singing. You need just to go somebody in the congregation and give them a hug and tell them you've missed them. Maybe. Maybe you need to make your way up and say, oh my goodness, I am so guilty of not doing my part in the body of Christ. Oh my goodness, my pride's been in the way of Christ moving the way he should. Oh my goodness, I've been so busy critiquing other people that I have failed to be a part of the body myself. Because here's the thing, we're going to be a church like this, it takes each one of you chunks of our charcoal to make that happen. It's a song. We'll stand today as we sing this song, Our God Saves, and you respond however you need to this morning. Thank you, Pastor. I think we really needed that sermon today, and I heard Jesus speaking through you today. Thanks, Dave.